uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar, uh, Making Democracy Digital. My name's uh, Councillor Peter Fleming. Uh, I'm leader at Seven Oaks District Council, but I also chair the Local Government Association's Improvement and Innovation Board. Uh, it's fantastic to welcome so many people to this webinar today. I think we have over 200 people registered. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers. Um, and so hopefully we'll all take something uh, of real value away from what has been, you know, fundamentally the biggest change in how we do uh, democracy in this country, probably for the last uh, at least a hundred and something years. So, um, so yeah, so, so lots to learn, uh, lots uh, of stories to hear, I am sure, from people. Um, just for those people attending, uh, if you use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom if you'd like to ask any of our speakers questions. Uh, what we'll try and do is we'll try and put them together around some themes and then ask everybody uh, when we can uh, about those. Uh, like I say, uh, if you want to, it's a digital uh, webinar, so it'd be great if you could tweet out about it, anything that you hear that you think is particularly useful to the rest of the sector. Uh, the hashtag for today is LGA Digital. Uh, I managed to, to, to just get a tweet out as the clock was uh, was was going down and so that you know an extra bit of pressure that I didn't really need to put on uh, onto myself. Um, so the first two speakers today um, are both officers. Um, uh, the first is Brian Reed, who's head of Dem democratic services at uh, Cheshire East Council, and uh, Ka Karen Strachan, head of democratic services at Devon uh, County Council. Uh, they're just going to talk about uh, their experiences. Uh, I mean, Devon's huge. Uh, county. Uh, so I'm sure that there's been some uh, interesting uh, stories to tell around that. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, Brian will also have uh, uh, some interesting stories to tell. So I'm going to hand over to them without further ado. Uh, and uh, I'll invite Brian uh, to speak first. Brian. Thank you, Chair, and um, uh, thank you also to the colleagues that have joined us today from across the country. Uh, welcome from the wonderful borough of Cheshire East, lovely sunny day here in Sandbach. Uh, Chair, I think it's right to say that had I been asked in normal times to deliver a project for virtual council meetings, I'd have willingly taken that on, uh, but I would have probably said to my boss that it would take 12 months. But of course, uh, there was nothing stopping that rapidly advancing virus, was there? And of course, we too, as local government practitioners, had to respond uh, rapidly to uh, uh, deliver the priority demands of delivering democracy. Uh, we recognise, Chair, that from the earliest times, at the end of March, there were certain meetings that perhaps didn't need to take place. So we liaised quite closely with leading politicians, stakeholders, key officers, members of the public in order to understand what was absolutely necessary in those very early stages. And we re reached a remarkable measure of agreement amongst all concerned that there were certain meetings which could be postponed. And that was the cooperation that we got. Of course, that bought us a little time in terms of increased confidence amongst officers and members. And we were therefore happily able to agree that with effect from the beginning of May, we were able to deliver that full schedule of council meetings. I would say one of the critical success factors, Chair, was teamwork. Teamwork between members and officers, I think, in Cheshire East was brilliant. Those political differences, which might have been expected at some point in normal life, were put aside in favour of delivering that common goal of democracy for the people out there. We drafted, Chair, a memorandum of understanding that was agreed between the officers and the political group leaders, which set out various commitments, commitments by the council to members to deliver the technology needed, to provide the technical support to members who might experience difficulty during meetings or indeed uh, prior to meetings. We committed to giving advice to members and especially chairs, and I'll come on to that later. What were the commitments then, Chair, by the group leaders? Well, firstly, to champion virtual meetings within their groups, to encourage their members, and we have 82 in Cheshire East, to encourage those members to willingly join in the meetings and training and to raise with us any issues that there might be, to advise officers if any member needed particular support. 
And finally, as is the case with any normal meeting in normal times, the commitment that members would make all efforts possible to join in those meetings and that when they had done that, to remain within them. So, Chair, what technology and processes were introduced? Uh, it was clear to our members and to our officers that in Cheshire East, our members would not accept, for example, blanket officer decision making under urgency powers. Um, uh, members in Cheshire East are at the heart of decision making. And so we accelerated a program that had just started to deliver the technology needed to deliver virtual meetings. 116 members and officers needed rapid provision of new laptops, Office 365, Windows 10, etc. And by agreement with the leadership and key officers, we uh, agreed to all of that happening. We even called chair upon the good efforts of our mayoral attendants to make sure that this kit was safely delivered out across the borough to everyone that needed it. I think chair, we must say that critical to the success of this was the officer support. We found ourselves in a position where as previously, committee's chair had to have one committee clerk to do all of the business. Now we were in a position where we maybe needed to triple that support with the committee clerk, producer number one, uh, organizing the meeting that needed all of those individuals entitled to speak, members of the public, officers, visiting uh, members, and anyone else who had to speak were in one meeting, whilst another meeting was organized for those individuals who just wanted to observe the proceedings. And that had the benefit of avoiding any inadvertent disruption to meetings. And that worked really well. I think Chair, one of the final comments I'd make on technology is that Cheshire East Borough has the benefit of Job General Bank, uh, the SKA project, which is delivering the world's largest radio telescope to Cheshire East. Um, and of course, we're talking to our colleagues there that have got brilliant technology, the best internet that you can imagine, and the suitable uh, social distancing space to run a council meeting when that becomes uh, able uh, to be delivered. In terms of recommendations to audiences, Chair, I think training, training and more training is there. We've organised a whole host of training. It started with our regular welfare checks for all of our 82 members, calling them up to see how they were during the crisis, certainly during the first part, but asking them that question, do you need help? Do you need support? We also rain, uh, arranged a, a series of different training events, Chair, with trainings for the political group so that members felt comfortable within their own environment. One-to-one -one training, ad hoc training for different groups of members, but also training and rehearsals, Chair, for each decision-making body so that there was at least a session a few days before those first initial meetings and then a rehearsal immediately before the meeting in question. We took advice from the group whips to make sure that we were covering everyone that needed that support. And so, Chair, even in the first few weeks of this, we had over 30 training sessions and those are still available if needed. Scripting of chairs was essential, not because the chairs can't do the job, they're brilliant, but actually just to keep the meeting on track with the added difficulties and complications of teams. I think the final thing I would say, we're asked the question, what would you have said to yourself back in March? And I did speculate whether I should say perhaps retire. Um, but I think the reality is I would have said to myself, we can actually do this. We're Cheshire East, we can do it. And we've come out the other end confident and we've demonstrated that we've done it, Chair. Uh, Brian, uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for that. And and um, all I would add to your training, training, training is practice, practice, practice. Because um, actually, that that I I think we found as as in, as important. Um, Karen, uh, over to you for your experience uh, down in down in Devon. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, it's a real honour to be asked. Um, I'll keep this fairly high level as obviously in seven and a half minutes and hopefully some of the detail um, or questions that people have will come out through that. I guess my initial thought was, oh heck, what can we do with no meetings? Um, and initially we did a quick, quick and dirty review of the constitution, delegations, um, urgency powers. And my initial thought was, no, this really isn't in the spirit of democracy. You know, power invested in one or two people is not the way we should be, be doing things. It's not the way Devon works. Um, whilst the leader joked that he was very keen on that, um, it, it was said in jest. 
Um, we also had the regs um, in early early April and we actually had a cabinet meeting scheduled for the 8th of April so in many ways we took a big flyer in terms of promoting a virtual meeting and publishing the agenda to that effect so really what ensued was a very busy weekend in looking at the regs assessing them a bit of a sleepless night and thinking actually what have I done surely I should have waited until the June cabinet to look at all this um, the first meeting really um, felt quite scary and um, it actually felt very different. There, there is something really, really strange about being sat in your kitchen in a work suit, makeup and even lipstick um, to run that meeting so you feel as professional as possible in running it. So kind of roll on to the Monday and then there was obviously several practice runs with initially just members of that cabinet um, to get as much practice done as we possibly could given this was so so new. I think really we had no choice but to adapt and I think we still are in many ways. We're constantly learning, we're wanting to make meetings better and be the best experience that they possibly can on that remote basis. And again, we're continuing work on improving live streaming and also the dreaded hybrid meetings. And what I mean by that is we're, we're looking to do a piece of work on what meetings of the future might look like. Um, you know, from where are a big county, we're very rural and that that obviously has some issues for us we're now actually really confident in running our remote meetings we ran our full council uh, with 60 members on the 23rd of July and so much so it went so well that we're planning to hold remote meetings for the rest of this year we ran a bit like um, uh, Brian said from Cheshire, we, we actually ran sort of 60, 70% probably of our committee meetings during April, May, June and July, but really only cancelling meetings when there was no critical business to be held. And that was on the basis of kind of not wasting people's time, but also I didn't have a full team at that time, given a couple of people were redeployed. Um, moving forward, I would imagine every meeting that will be held because I've got a full team back. That actually stood us in really good a stead because obviously as a county we have responsibility for school admission appeals as well and in some ways that camps occasionally be a little bit more complex than, than committees because we've got panel members of, as volunteers uh, dealing with parents and obviously all the emotion that, that school admission appeals can, can bring to the table. Um, with having over 400 uh, and a backlog of the in years, again lots and lots of practice with panel members, training, dry runs, one-to-one -one sessions and we were at the stage during June and July where we held three four days a week and currently we're running three days a week through August just to clear the appeals um, in time for September when we'll be still got a bit of a backlog but we're getting there and we're going to obtain feedback from parents on their experiences of that and I think from that experience we've got exclusion appeals in the offing and again it's given us a little bit more confidence to deal with that uh, I'm talking now from a process or technology point of view but obviously with exclusions it's that human element and we would obviously be careful to make sure that no process would disadvantage any particular party in terms of the technology we've used microsoft teams we were we were lucky in that the council made an investment in this some 18 months earlier and we'd we'd had a change team who were encouraging many people across the council to take this up um, as we all do, we revert to type. People went back to using emails, not using the Teams functions, but obviously that was no longer an option. So we went begging to this team and they were absolutely fantastic in, in providing support for us all. So a bit like Brian said, we did the preparation of a, meet, a formal meetings protocol, applying the regulations to our own standing orders. I think ours maybe was one of the first, probably not the first, but one of the first. And for once in my life, I felt really popular, particularly among some of my democratic services colleagues across other authorities and districts. So, so that was quite nice. I think the key for me was wanting the protocol to be as close to current processes, standing orders, and also public partition participation as it could be so ensuring people still have the opportunities to ask questions make representations submit petitions albeit um, remotely and we needed to ensure that this was the case so I think accessibility really was was at the forefront of my thinking obviously the tech technology is changing constantly it's being updated we're getting obviously there's the teams versus zoom argument and obviously teams is coming up with new functionality all the time and and for me i'm particularly looking forward to voting functionality on some of these systems so no more roll calls for me um which obviously take quite a long time 
Moving on to the tips, I think be absolutely clear on your processes, and that's for people managing the meeting, clerks, DSOs, and chairs. How do you want to run your meeting? Do you want to use hands up? Do you want to use chat functions? Do you want to use voting? Be absolutely clear at that at the start of the meeting. And again, this is going to sound very familiar. I've got down practice, practice, practice. Um, all those hints and tips, you know, if you practice, you get good at it, you avoid any embarrassments. Um, you know which we all want to avoid again teamwork share the load you can't do all of it i dragged in five staff for the agm um all having unique roles one helping with people getting into the meeting people keeping an eye on voting participant list chat all of those things and also uh, for the live streaming as well training um, information to the public we found is very important uh, particularly from the participation perspective enter the meetings nice and early, sort out issues early. Um, you know, when people join two minutes and say they're having problems, um, then that's not helpful. And again, we've all experienced the issue with rogue mics and videos. Um, I think adapting and moving forward will be the name of the game. Um, for us in Devon, we, well, and, and for me, I want to get the best experience possible for remote meetings. And if we can make it work, it provides huge opportunities and flexibility in the future for the role of a counsellor and expanding that role. Um, this is very interesting. And Brian might smile when I say this because Brian, um, Brian and Reed and I had a little conversation about what our messages might be. And he said, don't steal my thunder and, and say you're going on a cruise. Um, I'm a little bit of a worrier at heart and my boss was actually seconded to excess death so had her hands full with other things so I was a little bit anxious around the complete culture chain um, the, the complete culture change that we were facing and questioning are we doing this right so my message to myself will be sleep better because we can do this <laughs> sorry Brian I know and that's it from me thank you very much Aaron, that that's fan fantastic thank you so much for that We've got a, a ton of questions coming in and I'm just going to pick a couple of them and uh, anybody feel free to, to jump in because I may well be wrong on this. Uh, a lot of questions around uh, will legislation be needed to go back to where we were or to allow for hybrid meetings. My understanding is that is needed um, but, um, uh, and, and, um, and I'm getting nods so that means I haven't gone too far off script. That's always a, it's always a good start. Uh, and, and the second thing is about platforms and, and Karen, you sort of you sort of hinted on the platform thing. What I would do is I would do a massive plug for the um, LGA Remote Meeting Hub, um, which you literally can just Google LGA Remote Meeting Hub. It's got all of the platforms, the pros and cons. Um, uh, it's, it, I, always, I always have a wry smile when I see questions that are framed. Um, our officers say that we can't use X or Y platform, um, which kind of says to me that they probably prefer a, a platform um, over another one. But it may be to do with the technology that, that, that your council uses uh, or, or for, other, for other particular reasons. Um, but the LGA Remote Meeting Hub has got huge amount of uh, learning, uh, examples, and it literally goes through every one of the platforms and talks about the pros and cons. Uh, of each of them so um, uh, that's where I would I would definitely go uh, for that um, Karen and Brian we're going to come back to you uh, a bit later uh, but thank you so much for now and now um, I'm really pleased uh, to introduce uh, Nadira, Sharla and John. Nadira is uh, a Director of Leadership and Development and Research, uh, let's not forget that as well at Soccer Team. Uh, Sharla, uh, we used to work together, uh, which uh, was really nice, and it's lovely to see you. Is head of member services at NALC, which is the National Association of Local Councils, looks after town and parish councils, like ten and a half thousand of them, is it? Yeah, um, that's quite a few members. Um, and um, and finally, John Austin, who's chair of the Association of Democratic Services Officers. Um, so uh, I'm going to go to Nadira first. So uh, Nadira, welcome. And thank you so much for taking time out today. Lovely. Great to be here, um, Chair. So I guess my, my first question to you is, um, looking at your members as a, as, a, as a wider group, how do you think that they've uh, adapted to those new ways of, of working? So first of all, I'm delighted to be a part of the discussion this morning. Um, and 
really just building on some of the points that have been said this morning, Chair. So first of all, um, Charlotte and John are to follow, um, but I'd like to really emphasise the um, opportunity of working in collaboration with the LGA in, and with our um, counter organisations to ensure a collaborative joined up response has been given across the board such that um, we've been very unanimous in, in our messaging, how we wanted to approach the outcomes of the way in which we've been working together. Um, and you mentioned the LGA Resource Hub, indeed a very, very uh, useful and helpful asset and resource for, for individuals having the opportunity to, to come together to sh share the learning from the work that we've done collectively. So that's been um, fabulous. Um, some of the discussions about the, the technology, the platforms, the culture, the changes have already been mentioned, Chair. So, you know, our initial response, as, as Karen and Brian both highlighted, it was very much, how do we bring some order to this chaos? How do we get a better understanding of what the requirements are? How do we use the, the technology and the investment that we've made to date to ensure that we are better placed to be more responsive and deliver the functions and the duties of, of uh, public service. So our members, um, the, the first couple of weeks and months, it was very much a flurry of anxiety, stress, activity, and looking to, to us to give them some steer and guidance, um, both from a, an operational perspective, so very much how do we capitalize on, on the, the ways of working and digital skills, literacy, um, access to the technology platforms etc but more from a kind of public meetings perspective if we keep on on message here it was how do we use the technology platforms and depending on the level of investment and the choices that has already been referenced um, you know teams teams live seems to be the, the kind of um, platforms of choice but zoom webex and the at least 15 others that that we had highlighted through the work that we'd done collaboratively um, and depending on where people were on their kind of journey and maturity of the use of the platforms, you know, the kind of direction of travel, the, the, the need to speed up the investment in terms of deployment, training, skills has been very much at the, the forefront of the way in which our members have, have requested um, some guidance and insight. So coupled with that, of course, is the point that we made about moving from the physical ways of working to the virtual and also you know some of the points that Karen made so very much about the culture and etiquette and how do we actually physically uh, virtually support these meetings what are the roles and responsibilities and how do we ensure that people are very clear about their participation and involvement and engagement in the delivery of these meetings so it's been quite turbulent, but what has been really, really useful now, as we've clearly seen is, people now have got to the point where they feel comfortable with what they've achieved, some standard templates in terms of the process, the technology, the etiquette, the culture have been achieved, far more replicable and easier to manage now where um, it, it's almost in repeat mode. Of course, Nadira, one of, one of the issues is a lot of councils uh, invested really heavily in the ability to stream meetings from their physical buildings, um, you know, at, 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 and that sort of technology, uh, only to now find out that actually, you know, that that's now gathering dust in the physical building, and they've had to move to a very different model, um, which which of course opened the market up massively. So we moved from some quite niche models to you know easily accessible ones that people could just download onto their computer without having to go back into the office and have loads of support and I guess that's where you you may move from something like Microsoft Teams which tends to be on the work computer to something like Zoom which is really easy for you just to download onto your phone and uh, and do so do you think that there'll be a shift in the in the technology and and the openness of councils to use um, like apps and technology that is just out there um, that's being used by the rather than going down the route of like buying fairly niche uh, technology? So I think there is still some work to be done to understand how we move forward with the way in which we deliver our meetings. And I think Karen mentioned hybrid meetings. So there is still some work to be done as to whether or not we can facilitate a mixture of, you know, from home and in the office. 
So in that regard, the investments that have been made in terms of public eye or usually, you know, the webcasting of choice, um, we would still have the opportunity to use that if we are able to ensure that the technology and the way in which we work, both physically and virtually, can be combined in a, in a successful way. So I think there is still some merit in, in exploiting uh, those options as we go forward. Without a doubt, the versatility of working from home and access to the technology that we have clearly demonstrated that we can, once again, I think it's going to very much be based on the culture and leadership of the organizations themselves as to how they want to progress. From our perspective at Soccer Team, we undertook a COVID-19 survey more recently over the last couple of months, Chair, and what's very evident is the improvement and increase in productivity and homeworking, 5% before COVID hit us, 82% post-COVID. So it's huge. Yeah. The consideration becomes one of health, well-being, and how much our workforce and staff welcome the opportunity of working in a co-location where they have the opportunity to meet. The technology will allow us to do anything, Chair. Yep. It's, it's the culture and leadership of the organisations and what they want to achieve going forwards. Brilliant. Thank but you. But certainly an opportunity to exploit what's available to us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Nadira. That's, that's fantastic. Really insightful. Um, Charlotte, uh, obviously you have a hugely diverse membership yes. um, from, you know, multi-million pound councils to those that, you know, precept in the you know, maybe a thousand pounds a year. Zero, yeah. Or zero, like, nothing. Um, so, like, what the hell has the experience been like? Across, I mean, just trying to even begin to explain what that looks like. Mm. It has been, I think your opening captured it really well in that it's, not to be overdramatic, it's been nothing short of really revolutionary for the town and parish councils. Again, if, you, if you'd said to us in January, Dear Nell, could you support 10,000 organisations um, in, in very rural areas, very small um, organisations, um, you know, typically with an age bracket that's a, a bit higher, um, you know, there's never, never had any sort of really remote working before. Could you in the space of even 12 months move 10% of them onto online meetings and my grey hairs would have started sort of you know, you always say yes, but, and you know, you, you, we're there to represent our members and tell the world that anything's possible. But, but then what we saw has completely, I, you know, completely changed my perception of the sector and what we're capable of. And it's been, I think, one of the biggest shifts for town and parish councils in, in modern times. So when the meeting uh, regulations came in, I think they came in over a weekend and by Tuesday, parishes were tweeting about their first online meetings. And um and it just blew my mind we're getting data in now it's a bit we don't have national data yet but from the count some counties that have surveyed their towns and parishes we're talking about maybe 90 percent plus take up of remote meetings um and you know it's i think we also have been then you know kind of trying to get a sense check of has this been welcomed you know is this a sort of a necessary evil and we can't wait to go back to the old ways of working but our feedback from our members is nothing short of unanimous which again is almost unheard of for us as a membership body that that it has been a positive change it's improved the kind of quality of meetings public attendance has risen and different types of people observing and then looking ahead to the may elections and i you know, don't want to preempt what would happen with with um legislation but looking ahead to the may elections where we're due to have an extraordinary number of elections come may um to be able to reach out to a really different group of people and say to them, you might have an image in your mind of the parish council, um, but actually it might be very different from what you're expecting and you might be able to engage in a way you weren't expecting before. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's had a big impact for our sector. And I guess also given the size of our councils, the costs have been pretty low to negligible. We're talking about people really working with what they've got um, but and, and I'm making probably. it work. A, a lot of your councils have very, very limited officer support. You yes. know, we, you know, some, some like one, <laughs> one clerk in my one work. One clerk time and, normally. You know, yeah. I, you know, I mean, how, yes. how, 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 how have they dealt with that? Again, you know, I think 
a huge credit has to go out to, to the clerks in our sector, again, normally working part time, often supporting more than one council. Um, and as obviously will have come with its challenges. Um, but again, actually, most of those clerks are used to home working will often look after maybe a couple of smaller councils if, if we're looking at that smaller end. So for some of them, it's a bit of a relief rather than having to traipse to different places for different meetings and so on. You can create a much more of a hub in your home office if that's how you work. Um, and, you know, whilst I guess it's a sector that's really built on place and on interactions with people. So there's definitely going to be a desire to go back to, to seeing people face to face. Um, you know, almost what's the point in having a small parish council in your village that never physically meets when you're probably almost spitting distance from each other. But um, particularly when we're looking ahead to winter and if there are future, you know, hopefully not future outbreaks, but also, you know, just bad weather and the you know, challenges that come to be able to say we can hold meetings quickly, simply and pretty much cost free. Uh, it's a no brainer. Um, so, yeah, I'd really and I'd, I guess I'd say, you know, to any um, councils that are working with town and parish councils is, you know, to really encourage them to give it a go and that it can be done at, at very little cost and even um, we have our own guidance for members that also talks about you know conference call facilities so if your broadband is poor you've got a telephone you can make this work and I think we've seen a pragmatism in the sector that even where there's no broadband we'll find a way we're going to make this work. Charlotte that's that's fantastic and and hats off to you because I, I mean it is I mean you we, we talk about the local government sector as yeah. in you know out covered by the but yours is just unbelievably diverse in, in, yes. in size and scale. So I think the one thing our members have going for them is, is that because of the almost the smallness has really worked for them, you know, to convene a meeting of seven people remotely is a lot easier. I don't envy colleagues who have to convene hundreds of councillors into a meeting. You know, doing 10 is challenging and it's been done. But, you know, we're operating on quite a different scale. Um, which right. I think has really helped us, but you know. Which is a, 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 an amazing segue into into John, <laughs> who, uh, who who represents those that, that have had to deal with, you know, uh, some meetings with hundreds uh, uh, of participants. I, I, I watched um, with with awe. Uh, I can't say I watched the whole four hours, but I watched the um, uh, the the uh, what one of the new um, sort of semi unitaries. Uh, meetings go on for hours. I think there's over a hundred participants complete. John, uh, your uh, your members, uh, producer, TV producers, script writers, uh, video editors, uh, gatekeepers, bouncers. Uh, talk, talk us through what's been going on. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. And I think first of all, a big shout out to all members and officers for the way that they have adapted uh, to the new ways of working and Karen and Brian's presentations earlier, I think highlighted that. And it, it, it certainly for me brought out the best of uh, local uh, democracy. Um, it's, it, it, uh, but am I surprised that democratic services officers have delivered? Not in the least, because I know, I work with them every day and I know what they're like. Um, they, they have um, really, really supported members uh, in terms of all of the things that we've heard before, training, practicing, rehearsals, support with the technology, and fulfilled, Peter, all of the roles that you, that you have outlined. And the important thing for me through all of this is that the integrity of, of the governance processes within local authorities has been maintained and in some cases it's actually been improved um, and that's been uppermost in, in the minds I know of, of every single uh, every single democratic services officer that I've spoken to and I know it's been uppermost in the minds of a lot of members um, and I think there are been, uh, there have been some fantastic examples of members and officers ensuring that public access has been protected as much as sort of possible. I think it was Karen earlier who was talking about education appeals and you know the efforts that, that, that both members and officers made to ensure that parents who were going through quite uh, stressful times anyway were made to feel as sort of comfortable and were uh, felt it, it was to be as inclusive 
as, as they could make it. And many, many Democratic service officers that I've spoken to who have been through that process have said they've had very positive feedback from parents in, in terms of the efforts that have been made. Um, I think uh, the, uh, another thing that has really uh, jumped out at me is, uh, and I think Brian referred to uh, uh, the efforts and also uh, working as a, as a team. Um, and the 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 way the councils have achieved so much so quickly has been down to that teamwork and has been down to that uh, sort of working together between officers from all disciplines with, within the council and also the members. So absolutely not surprised, very proud of everybody, every single democratic services officer and member. And I think, to be honest, um, it, it would only have been local government that could have achieved so much, so well, and in such a short space of time. So, John, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, and, and it comes with an explanation, otherwise no one will know what we're talking about. But um, in, in, terms of, in terms of going forward, um, clearly uh, there's a lot of talk about a hybrid approach, potentially hybrid meaning. Uh, you know, some people physically there, some people virtually there, um, or a blended approach, which would see some meetings fully online and some meetings fully in person. Um, where do you where do you think your your officers are around? You know, that next step, what what will come after where we are at the moment? Well, we are already talking uh, with the LGA and, and the other professional associations, and Dira and Charlotte are included about lobbying for a, a continuation of the ability to hold remote meetings post May of next year when the regulations expire. I think, I think hybrid meetings, as, as you've described them, people present but also people re remotely, are much more sort of complex. Uh, uh, Nadira will understand the technology much more than I, but uh, and they're certainly a lot more expensive in, in terms of the technology that you'll need and I know some councils have looked at them and said no you know they're we're not we're not in, interested but my sort of question is well, why would you want to have a hybrid meeting you know we've we've shown that remote meetings work in sort of many cases there is no substitute for meeting from people meeting in rooms face to face you've got that interaction so I think move, moving forward as long as it is safe to do so in the right circumstances, face-to-face -face meetings uh, have to happen again. But the, the, the important thing is the council should have that option to hold remote meetings where they think it's suitable. But hy hybrid meetings for me at the moment, as they stand, why would you want them? You, you know, because there, there are other options that we have shown actually work. John, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, and that was a question a lot of people were a lot of people were asking. Um, come back in a in a moment. But um, now I'm uh, really pleased to uh, introduce uh, some of my councillor colleagues. I've got uh, councillor Craig Brown, councillor Karen Lever, and councillor Sam Corrin. Um, and I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sort of try and move the conversation on um, uh, 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 to sort of more of a uh, how how's it been for you type question. And also a little bit about, not just about meetings, but perhaps about how you feel it's changed your role, you know, so in terms of interacting with the public as well, you know, have you, have you done things uh, uh, remotely with the public? So I, I guess I'll come to Craig first and, and, and then uh, probably Sam and then Caroline uh, in the end. So really uh, two questions, how's it been for you and how's it changed your way of, uh, of, of operating? Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today, Peter. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, of course, we've had to change to a new way of working, haven't we? And I think it's probably fair to say that initially there was a degree of scepticism among some members. And what was important in, in addressing that, and Brian Reed spoke to this earlier on, was that we had to get buy-in from all the group leaders. Um, we agreed and between us as, as group leaders a memorandum of understanding setting out kind of almost like a code of conduct as to how the virtual meetings were going to work 
And I think that was absolutely key to getting buy-in across the, the political spectrum. Um, in terms of helping that to happen, things that we had to do, we delivered over 30 individual or group training sessions to members who were perhaps a little bit less confident in the use of the technology. Um, so that was key. What's changed for me personally? Um, I also chair one of the one of the council's planning committees, um, and that has seen a little bit of a change because, of course, we've not been able to go out on site visits in the way that we would normally do. Um, so we've had to rely on planning officers uh, being able to take photographs and and uh, display them on screen so that members can see them. We've uh, other than that, we've continued to operate those committees in very much similar way that we have done previously. We've been able to have public engagement. We've had public members of the public coming along to speak, um, and members of the committee have been able to ask them questions in exactly the same way um, that they were able to before. But I think what has changed is clearly there has been less need for travel because people have been able to attend meetings from their own homes. Um, and clearly, and I think this is key, uh, particularly at the current time, the financial pressures that all councils are facing. Um, of course, not, being, not having to travel has helped to reduce costs to, to councils um, during this period when the obviously financial pressures have been particularly strained. In terms of how it's affected me and the way that, that we've sort of had that public engagement, clearly face-to-face -face community surgeries haven't been able to happen. But, of course, we have had social media that we've been able to use. Uh, we've still been able to use email to contact people, still been able to use telephone, something that the leader and I um, have been doing throughout the pandemic is making video blogs. Uh, to keep people up to date with uh, what's happening with the pandemic, but also what's happening with council services. And as we've been thankfully gradually able to reintroduce council services, uh, we've been able to use video blogs to help get that message across. Um, and so also I would say that the, the online meetings have actually enhanced engagement, uh, both with members of the council, but also members of the public as well, because of course, they've been able to attend from their own home rather than perhaps having to travel from one end of the borough to the other in order to attend a meeting. They've only had to travel from the kitchen to the lounge <laughs> in order to do that. So I think that's been a real positive um, and a real plus that uh, that we've seen. And in terms of just the final question as to whether blended uh, or, or continue with virtual, uh, I would say absolutely go fully virtual um, I think that it has contributed to the atmosphere in those meetings changing and being more positive. Um, I think possibly because members are not sat together in political groups. Uh, let's be honest, we all know there's an element of political grandstanding goes on. Uh, we've clearly not had that with virtual meetings because people are sat, um, sat alone. And I think also, uh, and this is perhaps a message to myself, it's encouraged members to be more succinct as well in the virtual meetings, which has been uh, which has been a positive. Uh, so I'll finish in a second, but I just want to close by saying, I hope that we will all lobby uh, for government legislation to be made permanent that at least gives councils going forwards after next May, the opportunity if they so wish to continue with virtual meetings uh, where they feel it's appropriate. It should continue to be an option. Um, and I hope we'll all lobby for that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, Sam, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, if I could add on to what Craig was saying about the green credentials for this, Cheshire East covers a wide geographical area, so there's certainly a significant carbon saving in having remote meetings because people aren't, councillors aren't having to travel to the meeting. But there's a much bigger carbon saving from the mentality around it that our officers are now working from home. And if officers aren't having to travel to meetings, that's an even bigger carbon saving. Uh, in May, at our first remote cabinet meeting, we passed our environment strategy and carbon action plan, committing us to be carbon neutral as a council by 2025. So uh, it's a big ask, but I would put out the message, don't be afraid to take big decisions at virtual meetings. I know Manchester have the phrase build back better. Well, I'd like to see build back greener as well. So there are advantages that can come out of this. 
In terms of the good points of the, um, the council meetings that are virtual, Craig mentioned um, people talking too long and more engagement. Well, you can get a lot more visiting councillors, a lot more people wanting to speak at the, all the meetings because it's so easy to get to. You do need to make sure that people are succinct. And one of the tips I would have is have an officer there to use the mute facility. So if somebody is exceeding their time limited, don't be afraid to say you've exceeded your time, that's it, and use the mute. We have an officer who does that. Uh, but also allow extra time, particularly when you're first setting up these meetings, because you will get more engagement, you will get more people there, and there'll be difficulties with the, with the technology. So allow people to speak initially, and then, but don't be afraid to use the mute facility if you think people are abusing it. Sam, John is, I mean, John literally moved forward in his seat as, as you were telling him to give more power to his, <laughs> to his office. He's very happy. That's the happiest I've seen John all day. This is, uh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that, Sam. Uh, Caroline. Thank, thank you. Um, well, it, it's really fascinating to hear what everybody else's experiences are. And actually quite a lot of um, what Sam and Craig have mentioned, I was going to mention as well. So I also thank you for that, but I will bring a, perhaps an additional perspective which is, um, I'm a district councillor in North Devon, which is very rural. So all the stuff about, my goodness me, we can actually have meetings to talk about climate change without actually having to drive is fantastic. And I sincerely hope that, as Craig suggested, that we as, um, as a sector lobby government to enable local government to continue having virtual meetings. I, I think it's great. Chairing meetings, personally, I find easier because with the help of, of staff who have been absolutely fantastic and supportive and really, really helpful, um, I think it, is, it has stopped some of that chatter that you get in the background. And I hate to say it, having the power to actually not have to listen to the chatter, you know, and people are maybe having you know, conversations on WhatsApp groups, I don't much mind, if I don't hear it, it's fine. It means, us, it means that we're able to be much more focused on the business of the meeting rather than asking the chair to please ask people to be a little bit more respectful of other, other people from other political groups. I mean, for me, b before I came onto this meeting, I did have a consultation with other um, colleagues around the country about other people's experiences. And I think for me, one of the really big issues is about that some councils have taken the view that yes of course we should have virtual meetings and of course doing everything they can to um, have the, the normal cycle of meetings um, that's not certainly the case in all all areas and there are some particularly of the metropolitan borough councils i could mention a couple but probably shouldn't who i mean there's one in particular i know who hasn't had a full council meeting since since um since march which seems extraordinary to me so it, it, for some councils perhaps it suits not to actually have the meetings possibly there's a political aspect to that um, i'd be happy to talk about that in more detail if people are interested but i think maybe this is not the venue um, i think the other thing which i would say is that um, certainly in this neck of the woods um, the broadband is questionable um, and it, it, it's interesting, it seems to be particularly for staff that they, I think, are quite limited in what they're allowed to use. So they're having to do everything through Teams and actually, the the platform should not be the discussion at all. But the practicality of them having a tool where we can actually communicate seems to be more difficult for staff than it is for councillors. Um, I think one of the the really excellent things that has happened has been absolutely as others have said that we have more people turning up to the meetings that we have because they can because it's easy. Um, but at the same time, the social media stuff we've had, um, there has been an outpouring, I would say, of um, extremely negative views about some proposals, particularly around cycle and, and pedestrian improvements um, that have led to, you know, the anonymity of social media, that we've had some extremely unpleasant um, experiences, death threats and so on and so forth. And it's not been restricted to any particular party. It's just, you've got a view I don't like, awful so i mean i think that but that's not so much to do with the council as to do with the um 
the ability people have to to think that they can just say anything because they're on social media for council meetings we've not had that and we've not had experience of being um on a meeting bond or whatever like that i i would sincerely hope that we continue to have these meetings um i think they're quicker they're easier but i am very very aware for quite a lot of the residents in the area that i live in they don't have computers you know particularly the more elderly but also those people on very very low incomes actually it's been quite a problem and the and the difficulty with actually engaging with those people remains a concern for me yeah, but that's caroline, not to say uh, yeah. caroline i think that's a really interesting question which I'll, I'll 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 widen out to the to the to wider to the wider group to to ask so i guess there there are two things about inclusion uh, one is around um, a question mark about whether uh, it will mean different people stand to be councillors and actually does it exclude or include more people than it than it than otherwise you know do some of our councillors actually struggle with this uh, the ones that we've currently got but does it actually then also uh, mean that more people might stand and I guess the second thing is about the public um, you know uh, yes it's really easy to engage if you just turn on the computer um, but it may not be easy for everyone to engage in that way. And I, I guess my, my question, uh, in our last 10 minutes, we've got probably three questions I want to ask, this being the first one around inclusion. Is this more inclusive, less inclusive, and do we have, have to watch that inclusivity? So uh, Sam, you're nodding. Uh, Brian, you're nodding. Um, so Sam and then Brian and then, yeah. Yes, I think uh, I'm, I'm quite attracted to the idea of hybrid meetings to make sure that you include those people who aren't comfortable with the technology. The other way you might get around that is inviting those councillors who are nervous or don't have good broadband connection to come into a council office and then they can run the meeting as a virtual remote meeting, but they know that they've got the good broadband, they know they've got IT support if they need it. But one thing I've noticed is uh, councillors who have young children, it's much easier to get to a council meeting where you can be at your you know at a desk at home at the council meeting and your children yeah. they may just need you know half an eye on them uh, but also there's much more acceptability now that you might have a child running around behind you while you're in a council meeting i remember two years ago i think it was a, a new zealand professor was giving a, a talk and a child came into the room and it hit you know international headlines well now it's happening all the time and we are we are welcoming you know, more councillors with young families, and I hope that will change. That will encourage pets. more young councillors yeah. to get involved. And, and pets, you know, dogs, cats, you know, all of those, all of those things. Uh, Brian, and then Charlotte, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. But Brian, uh, thanks, Jen. No pets in the office this morning, but um, I think we absolutely have to be mindful of those who don't have the means to join in via, uh, via tech technology uh, but I think I'm right in saying that the regulations of course say must be uh, um, able to hear and be heard and therefore there are options of course around individuals ringing in uh, not ideal but uh, does enable people to participate in that democratic process yeah brilliant and Charlotte Right. I'd say again, if we're talking about scale with 100,000-ish town and parish councillors, the inclusion question I think is the one that's really going to keep us animated if, if these uh, regulations do continue, is how you, ex you know, include as many pos people as possible whilst excluding as few as possible and some of that will be about investment, some of that will be about mindset and really, you know, that's a bit that might take more time and effort. I think what we've done very quickly today um, is is bringing remote meetings because we've had to but to really make them inclusive and accessible and reap those benefits That's going to be the the challenge I think for us the advice we've been giving our members is to expect hybrid meetings to probably be a standard part of life um, From now on because even if you go back to, to a pure one or the other remote face-to-face -face, you'll need to take account of, of disabilities equalities and so on and you might find it's not possible to ever take a purist approach um, but that that shouldn't cause you worry, that should get you excited that you're reaching out and supporting people in ways you haven't done before. Okay, so I'm, I'm, going, to ask, I'm going to ask the big question and, and all feel free to come in, which is uh, what, what, what does, and Charlotte sort of teed it up nicely, what, 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 does, what, what does that future look like? And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm probably going to go around the screen as I, as I see you, but, but, but John, what, 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 what do you think that future looks like? 
I, um, definitely, I think remote meetings are here to stay. Um, we will be lobbying uh, government as strongly as we can, and I know the LGA have, have agreed to do that. We will be supporting them, and as I said, having that option later on. Um, Brian and Karen mentioned the increased resources that are needed to run these meetings. Now, many councils, as we heard from Brian, have been running on a reduced number of meetings. Yeah, it's only the essential meetings in, in the main have, have been held. If and when we get to a situation where we're back to as much of a normal workload, a pre-lockdown workload um, as, we, as we can, um, there's going to be even more challenges in actually resourcing those meetings. Um, we've, we've heard from Brian, three officers needed rather than one. So I think we need to hopefully, uh, hopefully the technology will improve which will help in that, but I, I really think we need to be aware of the real challenges in, in terms of just supporting these meetings going forward once we get back to some sort of normal workload. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Uh, Nadira, what, what, your, your one big takeaway. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Um, so, we've proved we can do this. We've heard numerous success stories this morning, I think we now need to embed, reinforce and build. We've clearly identified that there are some caveats, whether that's infrastructure investment, whether that is um, ensuring that the, uh, the, the point about inclusivity is taken care of, but the benefits from our perspective and our members' perspective far outweigh you know, some of the limited disbenefits that perhaps we've identified. I'm hoping this is the way in which we're going to continue to build on the successes, but not for a second forget that we've got some further work to do to ensure that this becomes a matter of course. Well, thanks, Nadira. Uh, Charlotte, your takeaway. Okay, so looking, looking to the future, as, as a tier of local government, town and parish councils, we're growing faster than we've ever done before modernizing faster than we've ever done before and we can really say with confidence it's a modern dynamic set you know tier of local government close to the people can really make a difference in in challenging times and and for us the challenge will be how we really build on that and deliver um because these challenging times aren't aren't going away anytime soon brilliant fantastic charlotte uh sam your big takeaway thank you i think this crisis has shown how we can adapt very quickly and we have adapted very quickly to coronavirus. We now need to adapt to climate change and I really want to see these remote meetings continue, if nothing else, just for the climate change reasons. I think the question now is how we adapt further. There was one question in the Q&A saying that the remote meetings were more formulaic and you didn't get the organic energy. So how do you get that organic energy and uh, you know, new ideas coming forward using remote meetings? Brilliant. Caroline. I, I love the idea of organic energy in, in council meetings. It, it's not something I've seen a huge amount of. So it, it's, it's a, a fascinating idea. And <laughs> um, I, I think for me, the really big, big um, takeaway is that broadband is really important. And there's an awful lot of the country that we haven't, it, it isn't brilliant. And that council officers have been almost across the board just fantastic and that we sometimes um, don't make enough of how they have adapted so well. Um, I, I think that's really my, my greatest takeaway and that they've, ena they've enabled us as councillors to continue the work as, of being a councillor in extremely challenging and difficult circumstances. Caroline you're absolutely right and now Brian's blushing. Brian? Uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, I would just say what's not to like about choice. Why not keep the options open, particularly in the early stages? Some may be keen to continue the protections, even though the restrictions uh, from a legislative perspective may have been relaxed. So uh, keep the options open for the future, I would say, Chair. Fantastic. And Karen, your big takeaway. 
Um, very, I think it's, it's been mentioned in a few guises, but flexibility moving forward, not one size fits all. And that goes for members, it goes for officers and it goes for individual authorities as well. Um, echo what Charlotte and um, Nadira said, um, you know, it's about the work life balance and, you know, Devon, huge geography. This just gives us huge opportunities to work differently in the future. And I would hate to go back to what we had before and undo all the absolutely amazing and fantastic work that's been done by officers and members alike. Brilliant, Karen. And Craig, one on one from you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, virtual meetings, I hope, are here to stay. And I think it's an opportunity by which we can address or help address the democratic deficit. When I joined Cheshire East in 2015 as a councillor, I think I was the fourth youngest out of 82 councillors. Um, and I think that kind of speaks for itself. How, how working age councillors turn around to their employer and say, I need tomorrow afternoon off for a committee meeting or I need next Wednesday off for a committee meeting. Whereas with the new flexible working patterns, I think online meetings offer the opportunity for us to encourage younger people uh, and people of working age to become councillors. To do something radical and, and have evening meetings. Um, anyway, um, yeah, but... Uh, I think that's I think that's brilliant and, and and absolutely right, Craig. You know, I think everybody has sort of said a variation on let's not lose what we've gained over this period uh, and the speed at which I'm going back to Brian right at the top, the speed that it was brought in. You know, the idea if we'd gone to our our organisations and said this is what we're going to do, it would have been an 18 month project. You know, with loads of testing, but actually forcing us to do it has has, has forced us to do it. Um, it just for me, it's a massive thank you to everybody that's taken part today. A huge thank you for everyone that logged in to the webinar. Uh, loads and loads of questions that we'll take away and you'll be able to find you know, answers to that on the uh, LGA Hub. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and uh, do some FAQs from today and, and put that onto the Hub. Um, uh, and that's it from me. I, I'm two minutes over. I feel like a, a terrible chair. Um, but we did start one minute late, so I'm only one minute over. So uh, a fantastic thanks to everybody for today, and I hope you found it useful.